Hello and welcome to the AV Forums podcast for Monday the 3rd of February. We managed to survive January and joining me on this edition, Steve Withers. You ain't a man, you're just another punk. Kaz Harlow. I don't get strokes, I give them. And Ed Sally. It's like my ex-wife. 21 different personalities and seven of them hated me. Uh, welcome back to the podcast, it's Super Bowl Sunday. I'm probably the only one that gives a shit about that. But <laughs> you are you indeed. <laughs> yeah, you're pretty much on your own there. I mean, you know, all power to the people that enjoy it, uh, but it happens at a strange time of the day it takes an inordinately long time and i don't understand any of it so you know not not really the target market <laughs> you'd I probably guess. love it ed you'd probably love it um it american, does, I, sorry i was gonna ask a quick question uh, when does the american football season start uh it starts in september so is it it's a very short season isn't it though? yeah it's Sept- september to december and then you have the uh, the top place teams go into the playoffs and then obviously the, the playoffs then come down to divisional championships because there's two divisions there's the afc and the nfc and then the winner of each then meets in the super bowl which is the right. last game of the season it's it's it is complicated to get into i think i was at the right age when it started on channel 4 back in 84 um to get interested and to learn the rules and all the rest of it but it's it's a spectacle and it is a it is a, a a contact sport it's still a contact sport and it's um highly entertaining at times it's um it's it's the my my favorite thing to do in american sport at the moment is um is on twitter the, the there's a slow but you know growing support for um for for actual normal football as as we understand it or soccer of course it is over there um and i i just find it fascinating that um just the, the the difficulties that many people seem to have getting their heads around the idea of relegation and how that actually makes things tremendously exciting yeah, it's yeah. Like, but if they get relegated do you stop supporting them? It's like, of course you, of course you don't. But, but it's it's the whole idea that you you could invest all that money in a club and it might not go right. You know, just ask Leeds. I mean, it, it, I mean, the one thing that uh, Americans do get right with their sport is there's never a nil nil. You know? No, no, this is <laughs> it's, true. It, it's um, the, well, okay, yeah, it's, it's never nil nil, is it? <laughs> no, because because then they go into sudden death time overtime and all that kind of there has to be a winner you see so which makes it exciting i mean I'd, this season i don't know if it's just this season or, or it's been unusual but there've been some really high scoring and really entertaining games where it's come down to the last two minutes and it's edge of the seat stuff it's you know that's when it's really exciting well i, I mean yeah, it, it tweets their own and uh, i will say that um uh, the only time I truly enjoyed anything to do with American football is um, an, a, a, a sports come general writer for various American websites called John Boyce, B O I S. And he did a column for years uh, called Breaking Madden, where they, he would just mess about with the parameters of the, of the Madden uh, Xbox 360 game. And he did a piece where he created a character called Clarence Beef Tank. Um, which rep- still represents one of the finest pieces of writing I've, I've read in years. I'll send it on to you, Phil, because I think there'll be subtleties that, I, that are mm. beyond me that I think you'll probably really enjoy. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's all fine. And the other thing he does, if you follow him on Twitter, he makes a point. It, this is something that does, I have to say, blow my mind, that there are still that there, there, there are scores in American football that are technically possible but have still never happened. And I don't mean all-time highs or things like that. There are arbitrary number scores which have never occurred, and he chalks them off. If you chart through his um, his, his Twitter feed, he, he makes a point of, of noting every time one of these hitherto unseen scores actually makes an appearance. Yeah. No, it's good stuff. So um, that's how I'll be spending my evening. I've already got my um, popcorn. Oh, it sounds like you've got all, all, all the all quality healthy content in. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. I'll, I'll be high calorie intake while I watch what it. What time's kick off? Uh, 25 past 11. Oh, God. It goes on for about 10 hours, isn't it? The game no, 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 no. It's, the, the game's an hour long. Um, in terms of t- in terms of time. Yeah, but how long does it take to it get actually, through that? It hour? actually takes just over two hours. So it's not right. too bad. Um, Was that like including a, like the half time show and everything? Yeah, I think the Super Bowl will be a bit longer because of half time, but a normal game um is usually about two hours. Just over two hours. But it all oh. depe- it all depends on how, how well they play and how many times they go out of bounds and how many times the clock stops and all that kind of thing. So yeah. Um uh, there's other American sports I do not understand. Baseball, haven't got a clue. I haven't it's got a clue about it. Posh oh, rounds is a massive fan of baseball. <laughs> <laughs> and basketball as well. I mean that 
I I know it's a skill game, but when you're like 98, 99 is your scores, um, and it's just one end of the court to the other, it gets a bit it gets a bit boring. To be honest, someone needs to it, basically we need the Jose Mourinho of basketball. We need someone to come up with the entire concept of parking the bus in basketball it must be technically possible you just end up with you know you're still going for players that are seven feet tall but also weigh you know 400 pounds and it just well, essentially it's a non-contact sport though isn't it <laughs> well yeah but if they if they are essentially just a sort of organic wall it's a, it could be a completely different way of, of trying. halfway line <laughs> oh, yeah. but, uh, you could you could you could adjust the dynamics of the sport i'm sure if you park i'm sure parked. someone's thought of that Part of the basketball bus. Yeah, betting right. on basketball was a major part of the plot of Uncut Gems, and I had absolutely no idea what was going on with that. <laughs> Did you have any idea what was going on, Kaz? What with Uncut Gems? No, with the betting in Uncut Gems. No, but I mean the bets, the bets he lays on a basketball game. I had no idea what was going on. But yes, I mean he was just a, a very very regular better, wasn't it? I mean you can do the same um, at a casino. You can lay some ridiculous bets if you know what you're doing. Uh, plenty of different combinations, and that's all he was doing in it. He was making yeah. a bunch of odd. Really I know he was doing yeah. a combination better than the combinations. Yeah. Well, you see, the, the, the thing is, right? Stephen was nothing about betting, and it's something that I won't get into because, um, yeah, I, I, I know if I start betting, I'd, I'd get addicted to it. Basically, so I stay well away from it. But we were on a, an LG trip a few years back. In fact quite a number of years back, it was 2012, um, and we were at the uh, practice day for the F1 in Monaco, and uh, we were at Rag, is Ragcas Corner? Rascas. Rascas Corner. And um, they had a casino on the, the top floor of the bar, and we were all given fake money. It wasn't real money. Um, it was fake money, but some of the journalists realised that if they only took a couple of bets and then cashed it in, they got real money back. Yeah, well, they were do- I think they were doing a so, 50-50 bet, and then so, just yeah, and, cashing out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so they were getting real money, but of course, I, I gave mine to Steve, because I'm not a gambler, so I said, there you go, Steve, enjoy yourself. He came back after five minutes, I says, how do you get on? He says, lost a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, we were actually up from 200 euros to 400 euros, and I couldn't work out how to get the money out of the bloody machine, so I put another bet on, and that went... <laughs> <laughs> So it was worse than that, Phil. We were actually up considerably until I blew it all. All right. Well, there you go. Don't trash Steve with your money is basically the, the advice. As um, many banks have discovered over the years. <laughs> uh, right. What have you been up to, Steve? Uh, not much, really. Um, i tell you what. I did, um, I, I did a calibration on Friday. Um, and uh, name's Kevin Davis. Hello, Kevin. Regular listener. And uh, um, he's talking about how he likes to listen to the podcast in his, in his van when he's driving to work. Or at work. <laughs> and... Um, He's, 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 you know, of our age, Phil, so he, he goes back to videotape and uh, laser disc, and it was quite a nice uh, sort of trip down memory lane talking about the glory days of of um, home cinema and, and physical media when we had uh, when we used to get excited about spending like 200 quid on a, on yes. a laser disc well, box set. For, for, for 500 <laughs> lines of information. Yeah, yeah well, not even that. It was a scope ratio film. We were getting about 200. Oh, that's right, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, it was it was uh, very nice. So, um, and he also he very kindly gave me a bunch of films as I was leaving. He had bought them on Blu-ray and, and uh, passed on the DVDs. And uh, one of them was a film I'd never even heard of called Silent Part, the Silent Partner, which was really good. Uh, it was a Canadian movie and uh, made in the late seventy, made in seventy-eight with Elliot Gould in the lead. The first role I think for John Candy. And um, and it apparently it formed part of the what they called Canuck, Canuck exploitation. Basically, it was like Canadian exploitation <laughs> movies, <laughs> but it was really good. And I'd never even heard of it, so uh, thank you for that, Kevin. Oh, there you go. And also another listener of ours, Nigel, Nigel Henry, uh, over in Belfast. He uh, he said, Phil, this is for you, Phil. He asked me to tell you there was a thing on iPlayer. I think it's called uh, Pop Goes Northern Ireland or something like that. And it's it sort of ties in with we were talking about the documentary about the Troubles. This ties in with the music of the of the Troubles. So it ties into the, the pop music at the time of the and, and talk, counterpoints it with um, various um, issues in in Ireland at the, in Northern Ireland at the time. So um, might All want right. to check that out. Yeah, good stuff. Um, and that's a really really good documentary. If anybody's gets yeah, time to watch it, watch it. It's really good. So I'll check out that one if it's on iPad. Good stuff. Uh, Kaz, what have you been up to? I haven't done anything but watch movies. Okay, moving on. Ed? <laughs> uh, 
I've done anything except churn out copy for you and other people. It's been frenetic. I have written a review a day for the last eight days and will continue to write a review a day until at least the next weekend. Okay. Um, you just piling them up for the end of the month or something? No, no, no. It's there's uh, a bit of a rush job. I I, I had quite a, a, a manage a busy but manageable schedule, and then I was invited to help another freelancer out of a bit of a hole, not actually really of their own making. So I was happy to do so. So uh, I rather late in the schedule of a print magazine. I've got more stuff turning up tomorrow, and it's like, yay, let's get through that. So yeah. Um, nice and busy uh, i've done some cookery uh i've watched some random stuff on television uh no one told me that all the episodes of x files were on amazon uh so essentially i've just done <laughs> just just gone through my potted highlights because all the alien conspiracy bollocks are just was tiresome yeah, at the monster time of the week see, episodes are the best exactly ones. piling through my favorite i mean you no know, liver fluke man or whatever he was that thing in the sewer yeah you know, that's, that's still, one of my favorite yeah, still a good one <laughs> and and it must be said they're all there including the ones with the one with the inbreds that's on there as well oh, which i remember a, that one yeah yeah i mean one of the most like Oh my word! Because it's it's the same way that it, it's in the it's when there's actually no monster and it's like oh god that is just <laughs> you know where, where the monster's a big fan of share. Yes, that's on there as well. <laughs> <laughs> they, it must be said there was some significant shark jumping going on even oh, before god, David yeah. Duchovny left. Um, I've so, got, I've yeah, got to see well, the there was there was her, there was a there was a bit when Gillian Anderson's in pregnant for in real life and they kept sticking her behind sofas and everything so you couldn't <laughs> see her tummy. <laughs> yeah. Oh no, but then, to be fair, that that's a, that's a, a stereo a stereo a then, key part of television. She has the baby in, in the off period between I think between season two and three, and then she comes back in season three, and my God, she's got a rack on her in the beginning of that season because she's obviously breastfeeding. It's just the difference is obvious. Okay, <laughs> I guess she's. Uh, she gave birth then before that season yeah. started. It's amazing um, what you, what you look for in your series. Are. Yeah, I was thinking. Hey, Julie Anderson. And then I, I'm sure we may or may not have brought bring this up at the end of the podcast, but in case I've forgotten, the, the other thing, and I dare say, you gentlemen, if you've also watched the second episode of Picard, a question that I used to ask myself as a teenager, does anyone swear in this brave new world? Yep. Yes. Yes, they do. And with tremendous and satisfying emphasis as well. Although the Discovery was first for that. I didn't watch any of that. Yeah. It was more, but it was more the fact that someone stood in front of John Picard and swore at him, and in its own way, that was <laughs> that was weirdly wholesome. I enjoyed that. So yeah, that's what I've been up to. All right, good, Kaz. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've been I've been locked down. You've seen, I've just been churning films. I had worse I've been actually. Navigating a whole yeah, you have. I've nav- been navigating a whole bunch of uh, illnesses around, and I appear to have got your cold. So thanks for emailing me that over um and uh yeah it's been uh it's it's but, been mental this weekend everything got released like overnight yeah but as a as a movie editor you have failed because we haven't got a review of do little uh i i chickened out of that i couldn't i horrendous reviews even the kids didn't want to see it i don't understand Just, who thought that was a good idea I yeah. mean, the first Doolittle with Rex Harrison was a famous bomb. I don't think the one with Eddie Murphy did particularly well. I think I think Eddie Murphy did okay in it, actually. Yeah. yeah. And I, th- but I think that they aimed a little bit lower on the budget and a yes, little yes. Bit it was more it didn't on the two hundred million or something yeah, like this. Exactly. I mean, they they just didn't. It's a, it's a, it was and a they've food been show. spectacularly unlucky because they're obviously banking on trying to make some money out of China and all the cinemas are shut. So they are stuffed on this one. Uh, it's going to lose some serious coin, unfortunately. I, I did notice that Bad Boys for Life is doing really well uh, is, in terms yeah. of revenues. It's uh, that's quite surprising. It's, it's, been, it's been quite a surprisingly big hit. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a good, good film, but I thought it would just be my generation. I didn't think it would be a crossover, but seemingly it has. So there you go. Will Smith still has quite a lot of pull, and let's face it, it is one. It, it is there's an element of generational to it, but everybody's seen the first one. I mean, even if the second one possibly sort of faded in and out of circulation a bit, but the first one is pretty iconic. So oh, I, I think... don't know. Hot Fuzz brought the second one back into fashion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Um, I think that's that we're all caught up there. Um, haven't been doing much myself. Like like I was saying earlier on, uh, I had the cold last weekend. Thought I was over it by Wednesday, Thursday, and then this weekend has <laughs> just come back again. So there you go. I've had uh, two bouts of it, but hopefully that's it out of the way now. Um, 
And in terms of reviews, there should be some reviews coming up from me. I have been working on the BenQ projector um, over the weekend. Measured that. Uh, busy writing that up at the minute, so that should be out later in the week. And uh, some other bits and pieces going on. But that's about it. Uh, competitions, Kaz? Yep. You can win copies of Criterion's January titles on Blu-ray. That's uh, Being There, Peter Sellers' film, Holiday, and Sanctuary the Bailiff. That closes 11th of Feb. Um, Eureka's Miracle Worker on Blu-ray that closes 11th of Feb Eureka's Cloak and Dagger on Blu-ray closes 12th of Feb Hotel Mumbai on Blu-ray closes 13th of Feb Downton Abbey the movie uh, on Blu-ray that closes 18th of Feb Uh, Monty Python's Flying Circus Season 2 um, on Blu-ray that closes 18th of Feb we also got a couple that just opened including Boys in the Hood on 4K Ultra HD, which cl- closes 25th of Feb. Um, lots more competitions are open to being added daily, so head over to avforums.com slash competitions to enter even more. All competitions open to eligible AV Forums members resident in the UK. And we actually have a couple of previous competition winners. So we have D598, who won Rise of the Foot Soldier 4, Marbella. Thanks, Steve. And we also have UK Can UK, who won Western Stars on Blu-ray. It's an apt name there. That's it. Okay. And uh, just remember, if you do enter these competitions, don't blame us if you win them. Uh, So there you go. (laughs) Some some crackers in there that, let's face it, if you do enter them, you've only got yourself to blame, really. Oh, absolutely. So, uh, especially Downton Abbey, my God! Oh, that's going to be keenly fought. The uh, yeah, there, it is, the, yeah, it there is. is a, there is a mum contingent on this website. You know, is there really okay? Yeah, uh, I was just been looking at analytics earlier. Uh, that'll be the zero point four three. I didn't say it was a large. <laughs> uh, right, that's competitions. We'll be back in a sec with hardware. Okay, moving on to hardware and a couple of reviews coming up. And like I say, um, been looking at the BenQ. I can give you a, a few brief uh, things on it. BenQ making a big thing about these this line of projectors being home cinema projector. I can vouch for that. It is a home cinema projector. So unlike the W2700, which is a bit of a more of a crossover for gaming and that kind of thing, um, this, uh, the 5700, W5700, has been developed for home cinema use. As such, it's not that bright a projector and if you put the wild colour gamut filter in it it halves the output it makes it pretty dim Um, so it really is for a dimly lit cinema room or a dedicated home cinema uh, use Um, it's it's not bright enough for use in a room with ambient light annoyingly when it goes in HDR this is something I didn't like on the 2700 I don't like on the 5700 it locks you out of the menus basically Um, it puts it in HDR 10 mode and that's it and when you're talking about peak brightness you're talking about 50 nits so it doesn't even hit 100 nits peak brightness um which is really annoying uh, but it's a bit the only annoying thing of it because when you actually sit down i mean the measurements are not great the out of the box sdr is is good for a dlp projector um hdr it can't cover the it, they claim 100 percent dcip3 doesn't do that gets about 88 percent, and that's only at the 100 percent points if you're actually looking for accuracy through um uh, various saturation points it's miles off it just can't do it but then again it's a projector it's 2400 pounds it's a thousand pounds more than the 2700 but i've got to say actually using the projector and setting it up um don't go for hdr don't put it in wide color and it's actually a cracking little home cinema projector to be honest with you um and once you calibrate it up it has a really nice image quality to it um and i was using it f- from my normal projection distance onto uh scope screen now the only thing is it's it's uh manual so if you're going to go from scope to 60 by 9 you have to get up and zoom it in and refocus and so on but it's really quite quick because the uh, lens shift wheels are on top of the projector unit and the focus and zoom rings are on the lens at the front and again it's a traditional designed 
home cinema projector. So it's not like uh, the previous 4K DLPs, which have the lens off to the right-hand side. This is a central lens with the cooling at either side of that and a, a quite a nicely designed dark chassis. Um, so, yeah, overall, um, decent lens in there. It has a six-group all-glass uh, lens array in there, um, which is 11 elements in total. I did have a few issues with focus right at the edge of the uh, of the image, which was down to this particular sample. Uh, I'm not going to say it would be like that on every sample, but on this sample, I just, if I was getting the center completely bang on focus, the far edges were slightly out of focus, um, which was noticeable if you placed the menu to one side or the other side of the screen, the, the text was suddenly a little bit blurry. But there are some other nice things in there for uh, anti-dust lens cover um, hoods, it stops dust getting in. Um, so yeah, a nice projector, uh, nice zoom range on it, it's got uh, lens shift and so on. I know Steve's already looked at this uh, projector earlier in the year. So it has the 0.47 single DMD, which is uh, new from Texas Instruments, uh, same as the 2700. So you're getting 8.3 million distinct pixels on the screen, but it's still 1080 um, resolution, the chip. And it's got frame interpolation in it as well, which is... Mm. Uh, almost unheard of at the price point actually to have that kind of technology in there so if you want to watch sports like the Super Bowl on a big screen uh, then it does frame interpolation if you're you're not happy with the motion but I've got to say Although DLP it's, DLP, it's so. excellent with motion anyway so um, and the only thing I haven't tested yet which I'm going to test before I put it in the box is 3D it is a 3D projector so I'll give that a quick <laughs> quick test if I can get the glasses working I'll give that a quick test before I put it back in the box that's the main thing with 3D now it's the, um, keeping the, the, the glasses charged and then if if they stop working, uh, getting hold of them is pretty difficult these days because the manufacturers certainly don't send them out. But, but yeah, it's a good projector. Review will be up this week. And I know Steve's looked at it and you'll back me up on it being a, a fair yeah, no, yeah, I agree. It, it's, it's very good for the money. For the money, it's, it's, it's actually a really good projector. And we're hoping to look at some others around about this price point um, during February and March as well. So keep, a, keep an eye on the, the web site. Uh, we should have some more projector reviews coming up soon. Sorry, I lost my round order. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I could tell you just lost your train of thought completely. I'm Ron Burgundy. <laughs> You were about uh, to say web page, weren't you? One second. <laughs> I was. I was going to say web page. I'm thinking that's very nineties. Uh, yeah. So on the website, right? Uh, moving on. Um, Steve's been looking at some speakers that are not sound bars. No, a proper speaker package. Um, Polk Audio's signature E-Series, which is, uh, I guess you'd call it their mid-range. It's been updated recently, and it sits between the entry level T series and the higher end RTIA series. Rita? No, RTIA, not RITA. RTIA series. Um, and I have to say, um, for Polk, a surprisingly normal looking set of speakers. Um, you know, I don't know about anybody else here, but whenever I think of Polk, I yeah. usually think of speakers with about 48 um, drivers <laughs> in them. Um, and, and this is actually a relatively normal looking set of speakers. Uh, you've, got a comp you've got a choice of floor standers. I think there's three different floor standers. Uh, and also um, uh, bookshelf speakers. I think there's two sizes there. And you get a choice of two different um, center speakers. So, you know, it's it's, uh, it's kind of, it's primarily aimed at being uh, a system that can be either hi-fi or home cinema. There's no upward firing drivers. There's no, um, there's no sort of dedicated surround speakers. So, so it's kind of trying to, to sort of hit both markets simultaneously. And I guess, you know, if you're... There's a lot more cost involved in developing things like upward firing drivers and surround sound speakers, and they're not your core market. Then why bother? And anyway, um, you know, a direct firing uh, bookshelf can make just as good, at, you know, be just as good for, for surround sound duties these days. So that's what the range just consists of. I had a pair of the floor standards. The uh, specifically, I had the the S50E floor standard. It left a lasting impression then. <laughs> well, the, the, the numbers are all a bit boring. It's S50E floor standard. I had I had both centre speakers, so I had the S thirty five E, which looks a lot more like you'd imagine a Polk speaker would look like, because it's got six drivers, uh, woofers, well mid range drivers rather, and uh, a, a tweeter in the middle. Um, the idea being that they're smaller drivers, so these are like three inch mid bass drivers, so you can it, make, it makes the uh, the cabinets sort of narrower or less high, making it easier to fit it say under a TV or a projector screen. But there's also another uh, model, the S30E, which uses uh, a pair of the larger 5.25 inch, 5, 5 and a quarter inch drivers. And uh, that one actually, although it's obviously higher and therefore you need more space to fit it in, would probably be my preferred choice. Not because the other one isn't good, but just the, the, that, that, that speaker, the uh, 30E, 
um, actually matches all the drivers and the rest of the speakers in the system because the the uh, the floor standards were using the five and a quarter inch mid bass drivers as well as was the uh, S fifteen E um, bookshelf that I was using at at the rear for the surround duties. So I think tonally that that uh, centre speaker actually balanced out better with the rest of the system. But the uh, the S thirty five E does certainly make a good uh, alternative if you want something that's going to fit into a, a less space. Basically, I mean it's, it's wider, but it's not as high. So if you've got less height in your system and you're trying to squeeze it in under a TV or a projector screen, that might make a better option. Um, but overall, I've got to say, um, I thought they were fantastic. It, it's you know the, uh, the, the package I had, so that's two floor standards, two uh, bookshelves, and a centre speaker plus a subwoofer as well. The uh, HTS twelve. So that's um, not strictly part of the range as much as it's just one of their one of the Polk um, home theatre system, I guess, HTS, 12-inch driver subwoofer. Um, but they do kind of look quite similar in terms of the styling. So they've got kind of curved edges on, on the cabinets. And it's, nice, it's nice styling. It's it, Like I say, it's more traditional than you don't expect perhaps from a uh, from a Polk uh, speaker. But it, they're well-made. They're nice and nice. They, they look attractive um, without being flashy. Um, they kind of, you know, for a home sort of, that's great. They, you know, they get on with the job and they don't draw attention to themselves. Um, and they have um, in there, um, built into them, the uh, power port technology, it, <laughs> which has yeah. basically got a, a vented, a downward firing vented base port. This is at the bottom of the floor standards. Um, they also have it on, on, on the bottom of the sub as well. Um, and that basically just, um, it uh, smooths the airflow and extends the overall surface area, helping to eliminate turbulence and distortion. And uh, like I say, overall, I thought it was a really good package. Um, the, the system I had was £1,600 in total, roughly. Uh, and uh, I think for a 5.1 system, it delivered the goods. Lots of nice deep bass from the sub. Um, the uh, the speakers themselves were fairly neutral in their performance. Um, they had a, a nice vibrant delivery to them uh, and, a, and an element of fun to them as well. And I, and I basically thought they were a great little package. Okay. So if it sounds, the market... sounds like they've, they've moved on because Polk, for, for me, the Polk sound's always been a little bit forward. Um, a little bit aggressive at times. Well, I think because this is a more traditional <laughs> design, it, it, yeah, uh, it, it certainly didn't doesn't have the aggressive. You know, when you're dealing with the, their sort of their more traditional speakers, where they've got multiple speak multiple drivers, I, I think maybe that's a byproduct of that approach. But this this mm. feels like this feels more like a system designed for European and British homes than for the US market. Oh, well, there's uh, a reason for that, and this is important, because there was a news story, which I noticed attracted no comments at all, even though I I think it's probably one of the most important things that's happened this week in EV terms. A lot of these speakers were uh, tweaked after they were designed by a German gentleman called Karl-Heinz Fink, who I've mentioned in the past. Um, but these polks could be among some of the last where that happened because it, as it was, it went on the website. Uh, Karl Heinz Fink has bought himself his own speaker company. Now he already has one called Fink Team, and they're slowly working down from their forty-eight thousand euro flagship to producing products that are only moderately expensive. But he's purchased British speaker brand Epos. Uh, and that's going to be something that he uses to produce much more affordable loudspeakers. Um, and that's sort of, you know, think, oh, another speaker brand. But it's not been explained in the press release or anything like that. But it does strike me that all of his really good ideas are going to get their first, even if he continues to do outside consultation for other brands. And believe you me, he's done a lot of consultation for other brands. All of his really good ideas are going to appear first time on these EPOS products. They're going to probably be outstanding loudspeakers at their price point. Because, you know, for example, the Q Acoustics gel core cabinet, that was his idea. Um, and all, all sorts of other bits and bobs. He, he is one of the more influential people in loudspeaker design. So um, the great news is that we're going to get an unfettered take on what he thinks makes sensible loudspeakers tick. But in regards to what Phil was saying, uh, having heard the pre-signature 
versions and then these ones uh it, it does that they were europeanized by him okay well, that makes that sense explains it, then. but i i really used to like uh I, in fact i owned a couple of pairs of their surround speakers in the past going back it back to the 90s and so on when polk were first making a move into the uk and uh, i think they were called lsfx at the time and they absolutely outstanding speakers um for surround use because they were a bit more forward so i'd gone from uh having a Bowser and Wilkins dipoles at the rear, which were not very good, I've got, got to say. Um, uh, didn't create a very cohesive sound stage, but adding the Polks into that system at the time, and you could switch them between tripole and bipole at the back as well, and uh, oh, they were fantastic, really, really good speakers, but very forward. So interesting to see that they're trying to Europe- Europeanise their sound. Is that a word? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, so if you're looking for something that can do double duty as hi-fi and, um, and home cinema, Nice pair of floor standards at the front. So to give some extra kick to the bass and uh, a good tonal balance with surrounds and the centre speaker, particularly if you get the SE30, uh, sorry, the S30E, then uh, then I, I recommend them. Right, so moving from Polk speakers, uh, Ed's been, funnily enough, reviewing some hi-fi. Yeah, well, you know, it's it's it, it seems like a sensible idea and all, um, but I've been looking at something a bit, you know, more sort of logical and, and something which has wider appeal than many of the things I look at. Uh, this is the uh, smaller of the two named Muso speakers. We've already looked at the big one, the uh, Muso Generation 2. This is the QB Generation 2. Um, this is the most affordable standalone name product. Uh, it's £750, which is quite a lot of money. But um, as the review will cover, it does quite a lot of stuff. The In fact... The easiest way to sum it up is the only thing it doesn't do, excuse me, that its big brother does, um, other than have fewer drivers and the like, is that it doesn't have the HDMI arc connection on the back of it, um, which you can sort of say is possibly a shame, except that it's a funny shape to be used as a TV speaker on account of it being a cube. You, you, it, you can't sit it in front of anything unless it's quite got quite significant clearance. But nevertheless, it's um, got all of the the bells and whistles that we've sort of come to expect from this platform. So uh, it's full UPnP streaming, Chromecast, AirPlay 2, uh, Bluetooth. Uh, There was a recent press release that since I've reviewed it, it's having uh, CoBuzz support built into it. It's also fully compatible with Rune. Uh, And the most important thing is that with the original QB, which we also tested, I also tested for AVF um, a couple of years ago, it delivered great results, provided that you were a little bit careful with how you placed it, uh, thanks to throwing more processing power at the problem and tweaking the design. This new one, uh, you can, I mean, you know, provided it's on a level surface and not literally rammed into a corner. Uh, it will do some some really quite impressive things. Uh, the most important thing for me is that they haven't messed about with how it looks. Um, the name Muso is quite a good product by all accounts. Uh, in ter- sorry, it's great product, but it's 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 quite a good looking product. It looks better in reality than it does in the photos. I have always thought the QB is a truly great looking thing, just proportionally, it's perfect, uh, and they haven't messed about with that. They just put it in a slightly darker metal finish uh they put the new rotary control trim ring on there which looks incredibly smart uh and it's just one of those things it's an it's a lot of money there's no getting around this uh but it is it gets very very close to the performance of the formation wedge which we liked a lot last year but unlike the formation wedge you don't need room for all the bells and whistles to work um and does a lot more out of the box uh so you know if you were look at eyeing up the formation wedge on its own you probably will want to look at the qb2 as another option because it is it is very very close to that and, and the performance is extremely strong um the other thing uh and this is something i tested whilst it was here uh, without knowing what sonos were going to do further to what i was saying last week if you have older name equipment going all the way back to the original uh unity cute and uh and and the the unity xs and things like that you can park qb2s and and all of the newer products all onto the same network they'll all talk on the same network they can be made to function together as you know full party mode all the rest of it and it doesn't prevent the newer ones getting software updates and stuff like that it does rather 
emphasise that I still don't know what the bloody hell Sonos is playing at, why they can't m- mothball older products, as Name has done. It's not like there's any new updates for the older products, but it doesn't stop the new ones from doing all the things that they do. It doesn't make any sense to me at all. Just a small rant there, you know, just to... Yeah, I'm scared, I'm scared to come in there in case I got a slap. As I said last week, and I maintain this, Sonos hasn't done in anything radically different to most other brands. They've simply been more honest about it. The only thing I continue to fail to understand is why they can't allow the old products to continue to function as part of an ecosystem of ones, including newer ones. Yeah, that there's does, some, that, there's something here sense, that makes no sense to me yeah, at all. Yeah. But the Miso QB review, QB2 review will be up imminently. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. Um, this month, uh, I mean, I don't know if we're covering stuff that, I mean, you've mentioned some of the things you've got coming up. Uh, we've got, I've got two pairs of loudspeakers going up tomorrow for, for, for coming out over, um, well, over February. Uh, one pair is the new Acoustic Energy AE500, their new thousand pound stand mount. Uh, and I've asked some searching questions like, is it better than the 30 year old Acoustic Energy loudspeaker? Which is a question that makes more sense when you actually read the review. Uh, we've got a speaker from a brand we've never had any dealings with before called Kudos Titan 505, yours for seven thousand uh, pounds. That's, that's going to be worth, I would suggest that's worth reading. Uh, I have found an answer to uh, how you might find a more all-round streaming product than the Lindemann Lime Tree Network, which is a fantastic sounding product, but is nevertheless a little metal box. So I've moved, so got a suggestion for you there. And last but by no means least, having tested the Bose and Wilkins PX7 uh, headphones, it was only fair and right that we had a look at the Sennheiser Momentum wirelesses because they're exactly the same price to the penny and they do exactly the same thing. So we can work out which one's better. Okay, lots to look forward to there. Uh, mm. Steve, you may as well you know, tell everybody what you're doing as well, so we're, we're all on the same page here. Okay, uh, I've got the 77-inch C9. I've got the SVS SB2000 Pro, uh, the Zapati uh, 1SE Media Player, uh, and uh, the Epson... Uh, Derby. <laughs> T- TW9400, which I think was what you were alluding to, um, earlier yeah uh, phil and uh also um the uh tcl ray dance soundbar possibly was that rain best. dance ray dance all right uh yes yeah, i gotta say um, i know that their, their tvs basically have you know social security numbers as their model numbers which is a bit boring they seem to have gone to the other extreme with the uh, soundbar and gone for them, called it after presumably the person that designed it ray dance d-a-n-z but anyway, it's a soundbar basically <laughs> Okay. Are you sure they wanted to call it the Radiance and then realised that there's like 18 speaker brands? Already <laughs> something got <laughs> something got lost in translation between China and the UK. Maybe this is a Mitsubishi Starion moment. <laughs> right, uh, that's what we've got coming up. Um, we'll be back in a sec with uh, oh, it's end of the month, so we'll be back in a sec with Ed's playlist album and vinyl. I've got to say, with uh, streaming services, they, they, especially Spotify, yeah, they do get things right when it comes to obviously what you've been listening to over the year and so on. And oh, I've been, yeah, I've yeah. been enjoying my 2019 favorite tracks. It's been on uh, high rotation recently, but I, I'm desperate for new shit to listen to. So, new shit, eh? Okay. New shit to listen to. So, what what is that? Right. Well, uh, album and vinyl, they are one and the same. Uh, unfortunately, I suffer from the same problems in January that everybody else does. I mean, it's a long month. There are many things to pay for. I still haven't got around to having my TV aerial put back on the side of the house yet. Um, so album, the same thing. Uh, and this is a re- was a recommendation. It came out of Cobuzz, ironically, rather than Sp- than Spotify, but same principle supply. A uh, band I had no previous de- uh, understanding of. I'm dimly aware of their existence. They've been around for several years. Scottish band uh, called Twin Atlantic. And uh, they have released uh, a new, it's their fourth album, I believe. Uh, it came out in January, so it counts. It's a, a, a perfect example of this. Uh, and uh, it's a good, strong title. It's called Power in capital letters. Um, and it's, I just think it's a, a really good listen. Um, in terms of trying to pigeonhole it, which I don't think is advisable, but they were, if you like, the previous albums have all been a bit sort of, we would like to be Biffy Clyro. 
And here, they still sort of want to be Biffy Clyro, but they also now have been broadening what they've been listening to in the meantime. Uh, so there's just little twinges. There's moments where you could also be listening to a bit of Depeche Mode, Violator sort of era, uh, a little bit of White Lies here and there. Good, solid songwriting, quite anthemic, doesn't overstay its welcome. I thoroughly enjoy listening to that. And the vinyl release, other than having the most confusing beginning, because it takes the first song and loops the first drum beat without anything else happening for about a minute and a half, which means it being vinyl, you just wander up and wonder why your tone arm's stuck. But of course it hasn't. It, they just loop the intro over and over again, presumably to make you do that. Um, and uh, it's a really, really good pressing as well. So uh, that's that, that's been uh, something that has been on heavy, very heavy rotation for me. Thoroughly enjoyed that. Now, playlists, it's been another absolutely shite month for playlists. However, an organization has come to our aid. If you are a Spotify user, you can do a search for Audio Gold. Now, Audio Gold, I don't want to do an unnecessary plug because they're not, you know, they haven't paid to anything, but they're a dealer in North London. Uh, they sell hi fi, but they mainly sell used hi fi. It's a totally different environment to most, to most hi fi dealers. And they churn out Spotify playlists like you wouldn't believe. They okay, are just on machine a search. Done. What was it? Audio Gold, you said? Yes. I've got Audio Gold Expanding Jukebox. Is that the one? Uh, yeah, that'll be it. Okay. They churn them out. Um, now, they're also record dealers, very, very good record dealers. Um, I need to be clear about this. If you potter through the audio playlist, you ain't going to like all of it because it covers all of the bases. But if you want to genuinely discover music that you had no inkling of before, both new and old, get yourself subscribed to that and start giving it a, get, giving a tinker with that. It's really, really good. Although it is 371 hours and three minutes long. <laughs> Well, it's, it's it's a continuously expanding playlist. My suggestion is that you 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 know on Spotify it gives you the when it was added. I mean, if you want to start at the beginning, uh, you'd be done by the end of the month. Ish, yeah, yeah four thousand six hundred and sixty-five songs. But it, it keeps going. But they they add stuff depending on the records that they that have come in and so on and so forth. I've thoroughly enjoyed dipping in and out of that, um, and it's just a bit different to uh, in the absence of. I mean, as I say, I don't know if Tidal's going to bring back the quality of curation that they had. They don't seem to have any money left. Uh, and Cobuzz is still getting there. So I, want, I thought I'd do something a bit different. And also, it's on Spotify, which, let's face it, is the most used streaming service of the um, uh, of the AV Forum's members. So it's the one that's easiest to get to. One thing I would say is that whilst you could, in theory, use that Soundis software to port the 300 and something hour playlist to another streaming service. My suggestion is that you don't, because it probably won't work terribly well. No, but um, as Ed says, I've just gone in and checked it. If you click on the date, um, it will then do it in date order, as in what was the last one added. So you can start at the top and work your way down, basically. Yes. And as I say, you won't, uh, you'd have to be demented. Given that it's five different people adding to that playlist, you'd be a very strange person to like all of it. But there is some good stuff on there. And, you know, if you uh, are like me and it's, I don't know, as I home in on my 40th birthday, I'm determined not to just stop buying new music, stop finding new things and going, oh, yeah, well, everything that I listened to when I was younger is great and everything now is shit. I'm determined to avoid doing that. Stuff like that is, is, is how you how you keep pushing, how you keep finding new stuff. Yeah. I just wanted to add one of my own in there because I found mm -hmm. it recently and um, it brought back lots and lots of memories because the label is not in existence anymore and they don't have anything on Spotify, but you can find all the separate tracks. So somebody's done that and put it in a playlist. Uh, Tommy Boy Greatest Hits and old school so that's like oh, right back at the beginning of hip hop uh, I mean re way back and it's fantastic it's really well put together uh, obviously there's stuff missing that clearly you just can't find yeah. can't find anymore but there you go and I found another one and I can't find it at the minute to tell you what the name of it was but it's one of those um, uh, digging playlists so if you ever wanted to know where that break beat came from or where that sample came from and it was fantastic I found a lot of things that I've been looking for maybe 30 years to, where where's that come from? And finally they've turned up in this playlist and it's like, ah, that's it. So if you like that kind of thing, discovering where, um, you know, songs have been sampled or, or uh, breakbeats have been used and that kind of thing, um, it's really quite an interesting playlist. I'll try and find it 
Oh, just one la- if we're doing what one last thing uh last year this literally this time last year i recommended an album uh by an artist called emily king called scenery and it's cropped up i've listened to it constantly it crops up in loads of my reviews she's released an unplugged version of that album and it's got some tracks from older albums of hers uh steve who is permanently in uh, in this sort of uh, frame of mind will be delighted to hear that if in this unplugged version of it you can hear a, a song she did called hang on a second let me bring it up get this right called uh, can't hold me and uh, it's great news because finally there is the uh lady equivalent of uh, turning japanese by the vapors <laughs> <laughs> lyrically it's a lot racier than i thought it was on the normal album so there you go <laughs> i've got a quick album to recommend yeah, as well which cool. is a new one from ben watt uh storm damage which is really good fair enough friday i'll give it a whirl Never how are you actually. getting on with your how are you getting on with your enormous pink floyd box set oh um yeah i mean <laughs> price aside uh that the uh the moment you lapse of reason tour uh, Delicate Sound of Thunder shows that they, they filmed back in 88, 89 mm. uh, was shot on 35mm film so that concert which is the whole concert looks and sounds absolutely amazing <laughs> worth That's it for that alone um, yeah because I mean, obviously the, the Pulse tour was shot on video and you know it looks crap but shot on 35mm film fully restored um, 16 by 16 by 9 um, presentation uh, and uh, you know um, a lossless audio soundtrack um, 5.1 mix, absolutely superb. The uh, the the momentary lapse of reason um, has been redone as well um, because basically when it first came out, it was essentially a Gilmore solo album with um, virtually no contribution whatsoever from the other two. Um, now um, Nick Mason has redone all the drums um, for this new version, and they've used more of Richard Wright's uh, keyboard parts that they didn't use the first time round that he did record for them. So. It doesn't sound massively different, but it's more of a genuine Floyd album at this point, which is good. I'm glad that there is some worth to it because I mean, it, I mean, you know, you know, it's um, it's it's it's, I mean, it's you know, it's ludicrously expensive for what you get. But um, <laughs> the part part of the reason why it's so expensive is because you know you get you get DVDs and Blu-rays of everything along with all the along with all the CDs. So there's about sort of thirty odd discs in there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, w- I mean, in terms of live Floyd, the is there anybody out there? one that they did after um that's the, the from the wall shows yeah i mean yeah. those are I mean, the, there's just an an element of fury which i suspect those were filmed is, on 35 mil uh, i've again. never seen the videos for them i've only um, i've got it as a, no well i mean it's never been released they filmed all, the whole shows they originally were going to do it as a live show um you know as a live um, concert film and then it morphed into the actual film the wall which was uh, which didn't use any footage they shot, but they did film the whole <laughs> concert. Um, partly the reason they didn't use it was because it was it was difficult. I mean, you know, it's like shooting shows; it's dark yeah. a lot of the time. Uh, but uh, I would love them to release. I think Watch Waters has all the rights to the war stuff these days. But I'd like to see him release that because I just as a curiosity these days. Because you're, like, you're right, the actual live album they did release from the recordings from those shows is the is live really version good. of Run Like Hell. From yeah. that, it's as good as it's ever been. Um, yeah. Uh, so that would be nice. But tell so you, you that, that, that was your middle-aged dad rock moment. So, uh... <laughs> well, that's our lead, readership, isn't it? Or listen, yeah, listen absolutely. But no, it's, it's, I'm, 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 ple- I'm, I'm pleased it has some worth to it anyway. So yes. Okay, there we go. Uh, so that's wrapping up on some music. Um, if you've got any recommendations yourself uh, that you want us to check out or want anybody else to check out, then add them to the uh, thread underneath this podcast on AV Forums or on YouTube. Uh, right, so moving on, movie time. Cars can wake up again now and uh, get back in the groove. Uh, so what have you been to the cinema to see, Cars? Because you, you, you put a lot of reviews up this weekend and I can't remember if there were cinema or not. Uh, Richard Jewell, Queen and Slim... And Lighthouse. Did you have to get out the house? I did, yes. <laughs> and only one that was in the house was Uncut Gems. So uh, Eastwood's latest is Richard Jewell. And um, I wasn't expecting that much because I was a bit put off after his Paris effort, which I thought was a little bit disappointing. He used the actual people, <laughs> people which was I think was a, a misstep. I mean, they did that in a military movie once, and I think that was enough. You know, it was, it was quite clear from that that it, it wasn't the way to go, um, and and he did it in that, and and I don't think I don't think it worked. 
well, it didn't work. But um, but Richard Jewell, slow burner. I mean, Eastwood is contemplative and purposely paced, but it, it makes the shocking trial by media all the more um, horrifying that this guy could turn from hero to, you know, a- absolute number one suspect for the FBI in a heartbeat through some really overzealous reporters. Um, there's, it's it's quite horrible to watch. It's a little bit like, although not as tragic as, um, the Netflix series. When when will they see us? Um, in in the in the sense that it's a guy who's clearly not very good at defending himself. He's a little bit too honest for his own good. He's being utterly railroaded by. Uh, FBI agents will ruse every trick in the book. You know, come in, we want to just do like a a little demo recording with you on how you save the day. Uh, Can you just, for the camera, read read that you understand your Miranda rights, you know, just to make this look authentic? You know, it's horrific seeing that, that. Did that actually happen? (laughs) <laughs> because he did twist the facts in Sully. Oh, uh, you know what? I'm I'm sure, but it's the the way it's played out. He's he's clearly a very naive individual because he's so good-hearted. Uh, it, it's not very nice to see what happened, and even even if the nuances of it have been exaggerated, or perhaps the focus has been put on the FBI and the press, when I suspect the public themselves would have literally lynched him given the opportunity um i i think that uh i think they get the tone right for for what it would have been like i think i mean uh, i guess i think guess it's they, quite they prescient as well in this time that in, though isn't yes. it cars i mean fake news is quite a yeah quite yeah. the thing isn't it and it can just show you just how um you know somebody puts a little bit of trust in a news outlet or or the media yes. and you can be misled Yes, I think it's yeah, it is the time of a Twitter allegation. You know, it's the time where where you can you can put something out there, and I'm not going to get into dangerous territory here, but but you can put something out there with with little legal evidence behind it, and you can ruin someone's life, and that's been very beneficial for people who have been wronged, but it's also a very dangerous tool. And in this case, it's you know it's it's news outlets as you say fake press and and it and it ruined this guy's life it was horrific um and to to get to the end of it and and there's no there's no undoing that i mean he was literally the hero of the day and there's no ever getting back to what that should have been so that was uh, that was Eastwood's uh, pleasant surprise watching that uh, Queen and Slim directorial debut. I, I really enjoyed that as well. It's Thelma and Louise, you know. It's a it's a road movie about a, a couple who uh, don't think they're ever going to get justice um, by going to the authorities over the crime that has been committed, and um, and so they go on the run. And they, it's kind of Bonnie and Clyde, Thelma and Louise. They they you know they that's how they they talk about themselves as being the black Bonnie and Clyde but um, but it's more a Thelma and Lee's, Louise vibe to it because these guys aren't supposed to be outright criminals um, I thought it was very stylishly done and uh, again topical um, the, there's, there's a lot of themes going on there that are going to hit home in America at the moment um, the, uh, th- that and Eastwood impressed me. The Lighthouse was supposed to be the actual gem of the bunch. Um, I liked The Witch to a point. I did like the twist. I did like the way they played it out. Uh, so I was looking forward to The Lighthouse. I'd heard this is how Robert Patterson got um, got his Batman gig. Uh, and it's a hell of a performance from him. Him and Defoe carry the whole film pretty much because they're the only people in it but uh, it's yeah, very it, odd it, it'd have been trouble if they didn't really <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah it's very it's very odd i mean it's 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 got a, a hell of a black and white nosferatu vibe to it you know shot through with grain and sandwiched into this really odd aspect ratio it's not even 1.3 it's a really narrow frame um which suits the mood of it very stylish but absolutely nuts and I'm not really sure. Not really sure. There's enough there for me. It, it's it's worth watching for the uh, skill they put into it, and for the performances. 
uh, but I but I think there was a, a little bit too much crazy in there. So ne- was, Netflix, really? Possibly, possibly that's the way uh, where it's looking. Oddly, the the most anticipated of the lots. I thought Richard Jewell was going to be the uh, the lighthouse of the bunch, uh, but my pick has got to be Netflix's Uncut Gems. That is a gem. Um, I, I've always been a defender of Adam Sandler when he can stop doing grown-up sequels and really terrible Jennifer Aniston holiday movies. I mean, it, 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 when he takes himself seriously, he does Punch Drunk Love or Rain Over Me. He does. He puts in really Everything. good performances. You know, it's 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 like a different Adam Sandler. And I, I don't get. I do get why he does it. Uh, the reason why he does it is because his trashy movies are ridiculously popular and pay for his mansions and uh, and if he can churn out a bunch of those he can be the second highest pay- paid actor in the universe do you not think the other thing is that he there's he, there's always the hope that there's going to be the dovetailing like there was you know for example you know with like the happy gilmore and stuff like that where it is sort of trashy but at the same time sort of quite good there's always the there's always the sort of belief that lightning can strike twice and it might be that that you just chase it chasing something which is probably not going to happen i think i think i I agree with you to a point there was a time when he was a bit daring with it i loved his happy gilmore age i've got time for his 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 side of crazy um but uh what was the other one he did the water boy um, yeah, I quite like important. you don't mess with the Zohan. Well, I'm not I do, I wedding, do. I've got time for... The Wedding Singer's my favourite. I've got time... Yeah, uh, Wedding Singer's really good. I've got time for Zohan. That was absolutely mental, and <laughs> he, he sold it. But um, but I think he genuinely believes that the stuff he's doing at the moment is pretty bad, because he it doesn't feel like he's invested any kind of that effort. energy or effort into it anymore. Whereas... You give him something like this. I mean, it's it's a. It, I, I've compared it to Carlito's way. It's not Carlito's way, so don't get your hopes up. But it's a, a fabulous, fabulously tense ride with Sandler at at his absolute finest. Anyway, that's good. that's our bunch of movies for the week, and that would be my movie choice for the month, even with some other heavy contenders like 1917, and, you know, Bad Boys was fun, but uh, movie cinema-wise, I'd, I'd pick un- Uncut Jumps for the and week. And you don't even need to get dressed. You don't even need to go to the <laughs> cinema. <laughs> right, it, for... it was out in the cinema, but it's now on Netflix, so boom. Right, so those that we, those of us that do get dressed, what, what can we go and see at the cinema? Parasite. So this has been out for a while, but not in the UK. Um, I'm, I'm going to be taking a look at this. Uh, very interesting from the guy who, uh, Bong Joon Ho, who did Snowpiercer. So um, it's supposed to be very good. Uh, a lot of analogies going on in its story. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to that Korean drama. We've also got Doolittle, which we briefly mentioned. Um, I, I've got no interest in this. I did at the time. I wanted to sell it to the kids and go and see it and get a review up, but um, but it looks awful. It looks I really it, I think its failure proves that um, Robert Downey Jr. was hugely popular as Iron Man. Isn't necessarily can't necessarily carry a film on his own, a big budget movie, when he's not playing Iron Man. Yeah, I, I can see that to a point. Uh, I do miss him as Iron Man. I, th- I think he, he needs to find something other than... A couple than... Of more films like this will be back playing Iron Man before you can shake a stick, don't you worry no, about he, it. No, I he want... needs to phone up Shane Black, and he needs to get back on that yeah. ride. That's it. Do a decent small so film. So does Shane Black after The Predator. Sure, I, exactly. I want him to do the Kirk Lazarus movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, I want to see the full version of Satan's Alley. <laughs> <laughs> With Toby Maguire, winner of MTV. No, Best no, no. Movie I, Kiss. I want his Neil Armstrong take. You know what was it? Where they found me trying to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere in a refrigerator box. No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I know we need to move this along. So that's I that's. Uh, I'm I'm not I, I'm and I'm, I'm not going to go and see that. And uh, I'd be interested to see any neither any reactions either. of anyone who does. <laughs> uh, we got uh, Kimari seeing Birds of Prey. Um, I, I've got nothing for this. I love uh, Margot Robbie, and I think that after things like I, Tonya, I mean, she's good. She can act. Uh, yeah, I but don't this, know this doesn't what look she's good doing. I saw, the, yeah. I saw the trailer for this and the trailer for Black Widow before 1917, yeah. and I'm really looking forward to Black Widow, and I've got absolutely no interest in this. No. Partly. It just looks and so trash. I'm sure the poster part, was put off. Yeah, partly because uh, nothing against Ewan McGregor. I love Ewan McGregor, 
but he's a crap actor <laughs> and his American accent is awful and I don't buy him as a villain so as soon as I saw Ewan McGregor's cheesy grin on the screen I thought well that's going to be crap um, you know Ewan McGregor's great in certain things particularly if you know train spotting where he's basically playing himself but his American accent is absolutely shockingly bad and I don't know why people keep hiring him to do American accents because yeah. he can't do it plus the um, other thing is this is the Harley Quinn based on that bloody awful movie because <laughs> she was the yeah. best thing in that wasn't yeah, she really she was and, uh, and but that but that, that wasn't a really singing high praise <laughs> No, I mean Suicide Squad turning into Birds of Prey, giving it a this and the fantabulous and emancipation of Harlequin. I mean, no, I, I got no time for that. Well, let's see how badly that does, and hopefully that'll be the end of it because they've also already canned the other one, haven't they? Birds of Prey or is Gotham it, City Sirens? Is, yeah, Gotham City Sirens Sorry, has been canned. But obviously, everyone's looking forward to Suicide Squad too with James Gunn at the helm. Well, who's yeah. everyone? Speaking yeah, yes, me. <laughs> I mean, I mean, James Gunn is James Gunn, but but I'm not sure he's he's talking about a soft reboot. I mean, they they they're going to have to deal with this quite well to to draw me back in after the last one. The other one we've got is Underwater, which I, I was interested in seeing too, but it looks like such a limited release. Um, one of these disaster and un, underwater research earthquake movies there's clearly something going on at the bottom of the sea so um go, go, uh, watch, Chris... the, go watch the abyss it's a better film yeah <laughs> well, well good, good I, luck I finding there was the a abyss movie, yeah. <laughs> um, oh in that case meg the meg is still, meg, on, yeah. Yeah, the meg, the still on, on now tv so uh, off you go with that that's Kristen stewart and i think vincent cassell although he's not in the list here um so i, I would quite like to see that that and parasite would be my choices for this week and I'm going to go and see Birds of Prey. Are you really? No. <laughs> oh, that's what happen, happens when you have a free cinema well, pass. Yeah, well, you see, if I get bored and I, and I need to go and have spend some time somewhere, it's not a great choice at the minute, is it? So, Because uh, I don't think Parasite's shown at my uh, audience. So It's supposed to be really good. I'm really looking forward to that. Right. Best films of January um, 1917 for me. Yeah, ditto. Okay. Kaz has already given his, and yeah, Ed, Ed doesn't leave the I house. I don't watch films, so yeah. yeah it's fine. <laughs> well, I saw 1917 at the cinema. I, I enjoyed it, but um, but I'm going to go left field and go and cut gems. I did. I did thoroughly enjoy. Second choice would be Marriage Story. I mean, I know it didn't come out in January, but um, oh, you're going to do that I again, did... Steve? Yeah. I, no, it's I just normally me that does that until January, and I loved it. Yeah. It brilliant. Right. Uh, okay, let's move on then. Um, disc releases, Cars. Yeah, we got 4K releases of It Chapter 2, which you already covered, and Boys in the Hood, already covered. Um, Boys in the Hood, uh, it was a surprise release. I didn't expect it at all, um, but uh, but nice and proven pretty popular. So that's what's coming out this week. On Blu-ray, we've got Judy, um, which is Zellweger's shot at an Oscar. Um, she's very good in it. Uh, Fellini's Eight and a Half. We got The Courier, which is Gary Oldman putting in another phoned in performance with <laughs> Olga Curry, Curry. Steve, help me. Uh, Olga Curry Lenko. There we go, yes. Uh, from uh, Quantum of Solace. Uh, Criterion's Failsafe and BBC's Dracula Season 1, all on Blu ray. Contain yourselves. Although, if you've got iPlayer on a 4K HDR TV, you can watch it on iPlayer in 4K HDR, can't you? Or is it HD HDR? Yes, yes, you can still. Yeah. Um, that, that, you that can. can. You can yeah. watch in 4K HDR on, yeah. uh, on an L LG TV, isn't it? Is it LG? Well, well you can watch on any 4K HDR TV that has iPlayer. It should be. Should work. Yeah, there's no, there's no weird like hack to it. It's just there yeah, on yeah, iPlayer. Like, yeah. Right, uh, so best... Discs of January. Ooh. There hasn't been a lot out, has there? Ad Astra. I'm, I, going, I, I'm, Ad Astra. Go, I'm going Ad Astra on the yeah. grounds that there's not much else to pick from. Yeah, but and you also, get to say the words Moon Pirates. It looks, yeah, Space Pirates. It looks and nice. sounds Space fantastic. Pirates. I, uh, it does look and sound fantastic, and I actually enjoyed it. I know I'm being controversial here because I was put off seeing it at the cinema because everyone said it was just boring. I, I really enjoyed it. I had, had a lot of time for that. I mean, it. 
I didn't I didn't necessarily think about the science hugely or climbing up next to rockets as they're taking off, but I or riding I, a nuclear explosion on the way home. You know, you know what? And I, using a bit of metal to yeah, protect yourself. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Saturn with a bit of tin foil. Yeah, <laughs> Uranus. You know what? It was exciting and entertaining. <laughs> it was Event Horizon and gravity rolled into one, and I liked that they did. Um, space apocalypse now. I mean, it, it made, oh, made me geez. think of uh, it made me think of that Sean Connery film Outland when he uh, when they did Space High Noon. Yeah, it was you know, pretentious and it was utter wank. <laughs> Don't mince your words, Phil. What do you really think? <laughs> <laughs> I'm really disappointed that didn't make it to the poster. <laughs> <laughs> That would have I'm sorry. My time it doesn't no matter how much you two are bigging it up. It w- it was terrible. It just no. I, I, I felt think like a that wasted they time. They could have stripped a lot of the random little chats he had, particularly like, like with the, the podcast AI psych. But um, but uh, I enjoyed it, and I'm sure that people said that about Apocalypse Now at the time. Well, possibly, but I only enjoy watching that once a certain chemical balance has been, in, you know, achieved. So, and and I, I bloody love the film. <laughs> so that's that's my best 4K. Phil, your best 4K? I didn't buy any. I did actually. I bought uh, Spider Man into the Spider Verse, and I also bought um, um, Leon director's cut. Nice. Uh, bad, have you bad Boys, Spider-Verse? Bad Boys Two, and um, A Star Is Born. So I bought all those. I haven't watched any of them yet. <laughs> Ah, okay. uh, once for the pile. I bought a uh, minty fresh uh, pressing, 1999 pressing of the Boom Boom Satellites Out Loud, which had to come from Switzerland. It was on those records, it just wasn't getting any cheaper, and I had just the right amount of alcohol. To, it seemed like a really good idea to buy that. <laughs> um, but uh, that is, that's been a Holy Grail record, and it's got a song on it which the the estate of the bloke that wrote it who's sadly no longer with us they recognize a good thing when they see it it's been removed from all streaming services the rest of the albums there you can't listen to that song so the only way to listen to that song is to have a physical copy so uh, i just lay on my 400 pound rug listening to it over and over again for a bit it's great okay you've already had your audio bit to talk this is the yeah, but these discs film discs bit. just because oh, well. my discs okay. are gigantic and fuzzy Right, uh, stu- steaming, streaming, <laughs> streaming. We've got steaming. Uh, steaming. We've got lock and key. We young adult. It looks like uh, some kind of mystery fantasy. Uh, anyway, we got that, and we got horse girl, which looks a bit more interesting. Um, <laughs> that's it, it. Does it does? Behave if you watch, yourself. Uh, if you watch, if you watch the uh, trailer, it actually looks better than it sounds. Or, there's there's no chance I'm watching that. Yeah. Oh, uh, I see what you did there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Up, up, up. Um, but yes. Right. Uh, can we also, Kaz, presumably, just point out that it's not new, but Netflix has got lots of Studio Ghibli stuff. It does. It does. It just landed this weekend, didn't it? It's tremendous. So though. you can watch lots of qu- high of quality. Well, yeah. they're not new, are they? Uh, no, they're right. not. It's, the, it's just the back catalogue's been, you know, this is Netflix. By Netflix, yeah. You know, Netflix doing their bet, doing what it now takes to, you know, get people continuing to throw their money at the at the problem month in it's month a out. Really and it's a good idea. I can actually show uh, animated films to the kids that aren't Disney that I want to watch, which is a really hard kind of complicated equation to figure good out. Good luck with Princess Mononoke. That's going to be fantastic. <laughs> How old are they again? Well, you know, the six going on seven is going to be fine. But the what, for Princess three... Modern, okay. No, for most of them. Yeah. I mean, not all of them. Okay. I mean, but they're all odd. They're all really, no, really weird, that. which is why I love it. I mean, you know, there's we, we, we're going to it's going to be interesting. So, no, but, I mean, they're on there for a while. I mean, I, I'm going to pick them all off. I, I think I've seen almost all of them at some point or another, but it's going to be enjoyable to sit down and, 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 and enjoy them again. It's a, a really nice thing for um, a really, a re- I, as far as I'm concerned, a really good thing for them to pick up. Uh, I mean, I have to be honest, I think Netflix's gambit for survival now is re- bringing quality and at times not quality, but that's a different thing, bringing older content back that's a bit of a pisser to get at any other way I mean, obviously, it's a case of finding stuff which isn't now locked down to all the other people launching a streaming service, but Japanese things are a good place to start looking, I guess. Okay, time to giddy up. 
uh, and move on. You can see you can see where the edit's going to be on that point. Best streaming, I'd go with um, Little America. Actually, I, I didn't expect it, but uh, but Apple TV's latest Little America show is really enjoyable. It's basically about immigrants out of place in America, and it's a uh, very hot. You're, you're only you're only together. saying this because the guy sent you a tweet saying. Oh, I love that. Yeah, confidence. Yeah. Who's the star of one of the episodes in Little America? Read my review. It's uh, <laughs> it's like twenty years of reviewing, and someone's actually read one. But um, but yeah, it was. You uh, could rest assured he's not listening to this podcast. Guys. No, <laughs> sure. but that was. It was it was a nice nice thing, you know. It's a it's a it's a well put together anthology show. Uh, I think people get on quite well with anthologies, you know. Whether it's Love, Death, and Robots or this, you, there's always something nice because there's there's one poor effort in there, um, but uh, but they're generally good half hour tales that um, that have some heart and soul to them. You're, so you're lucky, so that. Has. That's it. Yeah. The guy liked your review because um, don't forget when we reviewed Bleed for this, and I managed to wind up the guy oh, yeah. based on the boxer, really hard, <laughs> really hard as nails boxer who came back from a broken neck, and uh, I thought oh, I don't want to meet him in a dark alley. <laughs> Living no, what like you about it? Well, I made a comment about um, it was I've, a generic, it, generic, it was you know, a generic coming back boxers, from you know, illness or well, whatever. I need one of the boxer that's come back from a broken neck. <laughs> Yeah, fair point, mate. Fair point. <laughs> I I would have uh, I would have chipped in for Picard, but I, I I've seen one episode. Yeah, I've only I won't seen watch one any of so the rest until until they've all landed because I'm, I'm it's it's not an episodic series. It's clearly one story. Uh, I want a few to build up before I watch it, and I, I can't label that as the best of the month, despite it being easily the best anticipated. Okay, because exactly. it's the only one I've watched. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the third season of Dix. I thought that was excellent. Juice. It's the HBO series from the guy who did The Wire, David Simon, about the porn industry. About the porn so this, industry. Is the this is the one I was talking about where the first episode takes place at CES. Oh, right. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. That, that, that was very good. And also HBO's Outsider was, was very good. I mean, we're still not done with that. And it is Stephen King. And, and as I Crap keep harping on about, ending. yeah, he's going to have Hand of God come down and end it. He can't so, do anything. <laughs> yeah, he, he can't. So, so I am desperately scared about that. But it's very true detective. So, um, so got a lot of time for that. There you go. Okay. Well, the, the rest of the TV stuff. Um, go and listen to last week's podcast because we we went through that. We went to town on it. We did. Yeah, we 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 did quite a bit. So, if you want more TV stuff, listen to last week's podcast. Right. So, to wrap up on this week's podcast, we're going to look forward to the films coming out in 2020 uh, which ones we're definitely going to go to the cinema for which ones we think are probably going to be big mistakes um, and is there anything original coming or is it all sequels, prequels or reimaginings or soft boots or um, yeah, is there anything original coming Kaz? Well Tenet Nolan's doing an original movie I mean that's it's it's fantastic when he turns up, does a one of his got to drop everything and go to the cinema movies because you know they're going to be original blockbusters that need to be seen on the big screen. It's uh, Denzel Washington's son, I think, leading yeah, the way. That's right, yeah. I saw him in Black Klansman. He was great. I mean, yeah. he is, if you close your eyes, he sounds just like Denzel Washington, <laughs> right down to the intonation. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, he's 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 got it. So I've got a lot of time for that. That looks... That looks tremendous. I will not watch any trailers because it's already sold me. I don't need the oppressive music. I'm going to go and see it. You don't need to sell me on it. Everything else uh, that isn't small is pretty much a sequel. Unless it's a little film, Kaz. You, what you're saying is the, the big films are, are remakes or whatever. So Steve's got a list because Steve's usually well planned um, and, and, and prepared. Go through it then, Steve. Okay. Um... The first film on my list that's coming out this year is Onward, which is the le- this year's first of two um, Disney Pixar. Uh, di- no, Pixar, yeah, Pixar movies. Yeah. Onward's the one about... Um, is that the one that's... Is, is it like, aren't they... Elves? Vampires or something? No, like Pixies elves. or Elves or something. something at this point, with... I'll just take back. Steve isn't well prepared. No, no, I, I've just done what the film's about. <laughs> anyway, yeah, I think that's that, coming that's, out. Yeah, and I like Pixar movies. So. Yeah. A Quiet Place Part 2. Yep, that's March. 
Um, fancy that. I really enjoyed the first one. It looks bigger. I haven't bigger. seen the first one yet. So. you got to see the first one. It's really good. Check it out. Check it out. You Fantastic really... sounds. Watch it in Atmos. Feel awesome sound. Yeah, which is uh, odd about a film. Side. Yeah, strangely, for yeah. a film yeah. called A Quiet Place, where not making any noise is the main point of the story, it's got an unbelievably brilliant soundtrack. Uh, in April, No Time to Die. Bond. Can't wait. Yeah, i got to see it, but I'm, I still... Yeah. After, after Spectre... I see, I, I don't think I took anything in when I saw Spectre, so when I watched the trailer, I'm like, who's she? What's the significance of her? Who's he again? <laughs> so I'm probably yeah. going to have to go and watch Spectre. You gotta watch them all again because it ties them all together. Does it really? I thought it looked good. Anyway. good in the trailer. I thought. I thought the trailer sold the film quite well because I wasn't interested in it before in I terms saw of, the trailer. In terms of a competent trailer that makes you want to see a film, yes, it was well done. It's just that there was after the trailer finished, it was like, well, I don't know who she is, um, or I certainly don't remember who she is, and and what do I need to do there, and what do I, eh? what. <laughs> So I, I, I can't say that however well made the trailer was, I can't say it didn't make me just want to watch the next Mission Impossible movie instead. I mean, anything has got a DB5 <laughs> with uh, machine guns, machine guns at the front the and, he's, and he's doing donuts. You've sold it on me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in April, we've also got three years after it was actually shot, The New Mutants. Which is finally getting a release. Is it um, actually going to get released though? Well, well, I'll believe it when I actually see it in the yeah, cinema. Exactly. So, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not sure that that's not going to go to streaming services like Disney <laughs> to Disney Plus. Yeah. Um, uh, in May, Black Widow, uh, which I'm actually looking forward to because I thought if, it looked quite fun in the trailer. If that is this year's Captain America: Winter Soldier, which which it has the vibe of, I yeah. mean, it looks it looks really good. But but now that you know what her fate is, I I think it'll not... be more complicated than that. I think it'll I think it'll work. I don't I'm not worried about the fact that uh, that they've t- tied up. Uh, they've done this after Endgame. I think it could I think it could work. We'll, we'll have to. I'm prepared to wait and see before I start talking about. It's just not... filling in the space, isn't it, between what she was doing between Civil War and Infinity War, isn't it? Really, isn't that the time period it's set in? Well, yeah, but I, I'm still gonna still gonna wait and see what surprises it has. You see, my, my my comment there is that prequels never work, and in my opinion, they never. Well, work this isn't you... really a prequel in the sense it's not necessarily. It's just a film about her. So you know, Rogue One worked. Yes, you know she's not going to die. In it, yeah, but yeah, but Rogue, she wasn't Rogue gonna One... die anyway, was she? No, but Rogue One worked, Ed, because you didn't know any of the characters. No, no, I suppose it's it's a it's a it's a universe prequel, not a character prequel. Yeah, because you you had no clue what was going to happen to this character, so there was suspense. Yeah, had a fairly good. Yeah, it wasn't, wasn't going to be suddenly delightful. <laughs> well, but if you watch the trailers, uh, the trailers didn't give the game away. It wasn't until you saw the movie that you know you, you yeah, actually. Yeah, but given no one ever mentioned them in any of the other films, it's like probably, yeah. no, probably I'm going to make it. Yeah, but did, they, did, but did they need to mention them? No, but. Um, yeah. So that's May. Yeah, uh, and then in June, uh, Fast and Furious Nine. Yes. Yep. Yes. Finally got a Mustang. Yeah. Finally got a Mustang in there. That's well, we've had Mustangs in the past because we had a sixty-eight. It all the a, boxes, didn't it? <laughs> and we had a Fox body, but yeah, it it was like, oh my god, terrible acting, terrible action, um, no physics whatsoever. Over the top action. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. With regard to physics, lots of cars, and the return wait. of a character you thought. Was <laughs> yeah. 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 I yeah. can't absolutely. They've can't stopped. Wait. Essentially, they these films now occupy different rules of yes, everything of to everything. Yes. Well, else. they're now just parodies of themselves, really, aren't yeah. they? My yeah. big worry is they brought John Cena in, basically because they haven't got The Rock anymore, and that could, you know, with, not going to have The Rock. Oh, I like John. Cena. Uh, unlike you, I know I do like John Cena, but I like him very much. He can. He's. Act, I think he's done some very, very. Uh, uh, good perform. Well, as I say, let, let me re- good is an important word in this sense because, <laughs> in the context, I mean, if, for example, I think he's absolutely magnificent in Bumblebee. Yes, he is. Uh, he's just like in a film of otherwise sort of noise and you know people who are less relevant than the CGI around them. I think he turns. I, and if he does another one of those, that's all he needs to do. Yeah. And then in June we also have Wonder Woman 1984. Which looks fantastic. That is a trailer. That's my trailer of the year. That's a fantastic trailer. Fantastic tune. Well put together. Definitely. It wasn't really even on my radar. I would have seen it, but like it wasn't really on my radar. But that was a, a nicely put together trailer. I'm looking forward to this. After that, we've got the second Pixar movie of the year, Soul. 
um, which I think is about some souls trying to, I think it's a musical, but so, like soul music as well, but it is about uh, a person's soul trying to get back to their body, I believe. Um, so that's out. In, and then there's a film called Free Guy with Ryan um, Reynolds. Ryan Reynolds. Uh, Ryan yeah. Reynolds. Yeah, that's the one where he's uh, <laughs> a, he's I've seen a the trailer NPC, for that. Story, isn't he? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, which actually looked like it might be quite good fun. It might um, be, or it might be Six Underground. Let's let's wait and see. <laughs> well, it's not a Michael Bay movie for a kick off. Uh, uh, right, then we've got Ghostbusters Afterlife. Um, really looking forward to that. Jury's out on that one, I think. I, I, think I don't know. Quite good. I think it looks good. I think yeah. it'll be okay. I've got time for that. Then yeah. we've got the Top Gun Mavericks. Yeah. I, will I go am looking <laughs> forward to it. Look, look, it's a problem, though, isn't it? When, really when's that? Top Gun, well, they've delayed it because of... Is it because of the football? They delayed it because of sports. So it's it's actually out in June in the US. It's out three and a half weeks before. It's out in July on the same day as Tenets, which to me makes no sense whatsoever. Well, I'll put it, it to you this way, Kaz. I'm only going to see one of those, and it ain't Tenet. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but it's not that easy. A, it's not that easy a decision. I mean, no, yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah, it is. It... But anyway, uh, Top Gun does actually, look absolutely that's fantastic. That's going to be interesting because Tenet and Top Gun are both big IMAX releases. Yeah. It's going to be interesting. It's I want I desperately want to see both day one, and I can't believe they delayed it because of sports. I, I, I can uh, because it's if it's the Euros that that's what it sounds like. Or, or yeah, no, the, is it it's, not the Olympics? No, it's the Euros. It's the Euros, is it? Right. Big deal. Euros oh, is Olympics, June, is it? Oh, when are the Olympics? <laughs> they're, this, they're this year, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, the Olympics this year. I, I wasn't yeah, sure if they're, the Olympics they're first and then the Euros. Also, in August, not, I think. If it's it? not being delayed in the US, it has to be the Euros. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's the Euros. Point, it's the Euros yeah. in June, which is why Mavericks. I mean, obviously, you know, blokes are going to go and see Top Gun Maverick, aren't they? Uh, so that does make sense. But it makes no sense to have those two films opening on the same day. It doesn't. At least no, make them a week apart. Yeah, it's a really, uh, really foolish decision. To be fair, nothing. There, there, there's still scope for that to change. We're still six months away. Yeah, oh, true. I don't know. They're pretty big movies, though. I don't they, care. They, they I'm going to see the, the studios day. know anyway. what they're doing. <laughs> Uh, really? uh, right after that, we've got Morbius, which I've got no interest in, in whatsoever. Which well, is, um... yeah, I, I mean, it's it's all because of his take on the Joker that I'm put off that. But I mean, the stu- the but subject also, it's, of a... it's, it's Sony's stupid Marvel, you know, Spider Man. Yeah, can can you explain universe. what it is? Because you're assuming that people know. Oh yeah, so Sorry, the Morbi- Spider Man oh. universe has spun off a bunch of things, including Venom, and now Morbius, who is a half vampire kind of good guy. So he's not not quite a bad vampire. He exists in the same universe as Blade, as Spider Man, and as Venom. And they're trying to create Sony are trying to create a, a cash cow universe. It's going to flop like Universal's monsters. Well, Venom did incredibly well considering oh, it was rubbish. Just we wait until the second one comes out. You just need to put Tom yeah. Hardy in everything, and there's a certain category of people, uh, not necessarily the same ones who visit this site, who will go and watch everything. Just putting it out oh, there. Oh, come on. There, there are some good scenes in Venom between Tom Hardy, basically Tom Hardy talking to himself very aggressively that work quite well. But whoever put together the rest of it just doesn't have a brain cell. Morbius seems to be suggesting that they're going to be bringing characters from the Spider-Man Marvel movies back into their universe, aren't they? Yeah, well, it'd be interesting at least... to see how they do it because Morbius isn't really a very interesting character without Spider-Man. No. So, no, none, none of the villains are very interesting without Spider Man. Well, I'll tell you, up to this point, uh, I'm going to uh, put my. Can, <laughs> cancel your cancel uh... <laughs> man limited card. Yeah. That's why I cancelled mine. Okay, after Morbius, we've got The King's Man, which is a, se- a prequel, sorry. Another yeah, prequel. Ralph Fiennes. Uh, although I believe it wasn't originally written as anything to do with Kingsman, but they've adapted it to a Kingsman film. I could um, possibly go and see that. Yeah, it looks fun. Ralph Fiennes is. Ralph is... Fiennes. Ray, Ray Fiennes. Ray Fiennes. Ray Fiennes, sorry. Mm, don't want to get yeah. that wrong. Uh, after that, we've got Death on the Nile, which I probably, I'm actually quite looking forward to because I really enjoyed Murder on the Orient Express. It's all right. He's uh, a good, he's a good yeah. player. Kenneth Branagh is always worth watching, and he's a good director as well. And if he shoots it on in 70 mil again, that'd be quite cool. Then we've got The Eternals. I know nothing about The Eternals. I know Eternals. it's a Marvel movie, but yeah. I don't know anything about the, about the, the, the IP. Um, I can't say I'm... I mean, I'll go and see it, obviously, but... Uh, I mean, nothing in Phase Four has been particularly excited at the moment. But the thing so, is, it uh, could they could pull a Guardians, giving you something crazy and otherworldly. They could pull they a pull could, a Guardians. I think they I mean, peaked. They peaked last year, and it's downhill from now on. Well, I, I really hope it's not an Inhumans. It's somewhere between <laughs> the two. Okay. 
Uh, we've got Godzilla vs. Kong, which has been pushed back from the beginning of this year to the end of this year. Um, no doubt because the previous film tanked. Uh, but this one was already in the, in the, in the bag before, the, <laughs> before Godzilla King of the Monsters came out. I'm probably more interested in this because I wouldn't mind seeing Kong. I enjoyed Kong Skull Island, which is part of the same universe. So seeing Kong back and, and having a punch-up with Godzilla might be quite good fun. But, uh, I mean, these films just... Uh, I just found them to be... I found them to be just noisy. I rubbish. think I think my difficulty is it worked as a, as a concept in the 70s, but the idea of doing it... They're going to pull it off in the same way that they pulled off Batman vs. Superman. It's going to be an utterly stupid reason to have these two monsters beat each other up and then then become best friends because their mothers share the same name. <laughs> you know, it's really going to be Spoilers, it's going to be an in, inane plot. Yeah, what did you know Godzilla's mother? mother? I don't know. I wasn't even born in an egg. Uh, wow, well, egg, eggs. Okay. I don't even know where Godzilla came from. Actually, I'm not. I must admit, I, I'm, I'm not down on his uh, entire history. Came anyway, a, he came because we messed around with nuclear. Yes, yes. Material. I mean, yeah, came yeah, as a lesson to you, Rusty. Uh, I personally, I really like the um, the Emmerich version. I know no one else does. But <laughs> I'd, I'll, my, I'll, ad- I'll admit movie. to uh, yeah, it's a guilty pleasure. <laughs> I do. Yeah, it's fun. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I found it had, when I looked at it 4K, it hadn't aged well, hadn't aged gracefully. Maybe the I mean, solution is that all Godzilla films need John Reno in them. That he's a lot of fun in it, and and I did enjoy seeing Godzilla eat Apaches. That was the the best bits when there's a bunch of attack helicopters after him, and he's literally oh, Apaches. I thought you said a pasty. I'm thinking of... <laughs> <laughs> a giant. No, no. It's like, like yeah, the old Chewitz adverts. No, um... <laughs> <laughs> ten out of ten would watch. <laughs> Uh, and then in December, the film I'm most looking forward to Dune. this year by Miles is Dune. Yeah, it comes out on my birthday. Just yeah. throwing it out there. Uh, can I just say that if you're going all the way to December, you have missed uh, the Bill and Ted film, which the chances oh, are I will yeah. go yeah, and yeah, see. Bill and Ted, yeah, yeah Bill and Ted. Well, we've Cause... yeah we've missed a bunch of small. Yeah, movies. I know, but we've also missed Bill and Ted. Uh, <laughs> so um, I do, half the thing is this could go in so many different ways. Let's be honest here, because um, how? When was uh, Bogus Journey? What year was that? It's Thirty years ago, isn't it? At least. <laughs> yeah. It. I. I mean, let's face it. In terms of, I mean, this is Blade Runner style levels of uh, of coming back, um, possibly with a bit more joy. I'm hoping there's a bit more joy. Um, uh, but I love those two films, and I, I, in many regards, I, you know, I do quite love Keanu Reeves as well. I'm, I'm going to watch this. I will I, probably drag my ass. I, I, um, <laughs> I thought, I thought there was two big Keanu films this year, is there not? There's another John Wick somewhere. There's John Wick point. and The Matrix, is there not? What, no, this year. Not this no. year. Is that next, next year? year is it? Yeah. 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 Right. I thought there's John Wick four this year. Uh, I don't no, think so. no, they, I think they both they come out on the same day because they're calling it yeah, Keanu Weekend. Yeah, I think it might even be, that might be the second coming. You know, whoever whoever <laughs> loses, Keanu wins. Yeah. <laughs> we all win. Yeah. So no, it's Keanu. Keanu. <laughs> well, right. Respect for twenty twenty one release, John Wick. So that's four. Oh well, this year needs to hurry up then. Well, well no, we you all know think... that you'll be saying, "I can't believe it's July with it." Before you know it, <laughs> <laughs> so, it's only a matter of time, isn't it? <laughs> Having been to watch Fast and the Furious eleven times and suffered severe brain trauma as a result, you know, I know I'm going to watch all the Fast and Furious films in 4K before I go and see them. <laughs> yeah, I'm, can... try, I'm going to try and do it in one day. I think just get up really early, and just power. The thing through. is, this always <laughs> seems like a really good idea, but then we forget objectively that two and three are. Yeah. Absolute bilge. But at least you get those out of the way early and it builds yeah. after that. So Yeah, and, and they're enjoyable nonsense. I question that with three. They are, because they're so, they're so over the top. It's like watching a movie with Jar Rule in it. It's like you can just belly laugh throughout the whole thing because he's speaking. So so I think uh, I think two's got a lot of comedy, unintentional comedy in it. And is actually quite nicely shot. It's the guy who did Boys in the Hood, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and three is so low budget, it's hilarious. It's um, yeah. It has one good scene, and that's <laughs> and unfortunately it doesn't necessarily carry a whole film. I did love that. Obviously, they you know for continuity purposes went back to Tokyo, so it's the same guy, you know, reappraising his his role, and you know he's very clearly invisibly aged by like thirteen years. Yeah. <laughs> 
but you know, it's, it, that's just little joys that boost the franchise still further. So you know, there you it's go. Not, it's not as funny as watching it chapter two and realizing they had to de-age the kids because they were all a year older from when they, or two years older. Um, from shooting it chapter one so all the flashback scenes they de-aged children in order to make them look even younger which is obvious when you're watching isn't it Kaz yeah yeah <laughs> I, I mean I think uh, I think that once you're in the once you're in the little gang like uh, like Phil is he's family now um, you, you get on with the Fast and Furious films because I remember having this conversation with Phil before he'd seen any of them and he was it, not interested. I, I did it in a week, Steve. So yeah, I yeah. Well, I might actually do it in one day. I think I think it might send me over the edge. <laughs> uh, apparently, there's a coming to America t- a sequel. Oh yeah, there yeah. is. Yeah, is that this year? That's yes, this apparently year, yeah. December the eighteenth as well. I want them to to pull off a decent Beverly Hills Cop sequel. The guys who did Bad Boys Three were looking at it, so uh, doing another Beverly Hills Cop. So if Coming to America Two does well. I mean, well, two. they've already confirmed Lethal Weapon 5, haven't they? Oh, yeah. <laughs> What's that? What's going to happen there? I mean, it's the time for... Lethal sequels, Weapon but... 5, so very, very tired. Hey, you, know, <laughs> you, know, you know what? I watched that uh, Dragged Across Concrete with Mel Gibson, and he's still got it. Yeah, he's but Danny still... Glover was old when he made Lethal Weapon. Yeah, Danny, <laughs> he was Danny going, Danny up, I'm getting too old for this shit. Danny he was saying Danny. that 40 years ago. <laughs> clearly going to be killed in the opening scene. In but his old people's home. Saying... What I'm saying, yeah, exactly. That, That's where it's going to take place. Is it going to be like a, you know, some sort of climb like in an old people's Bubba Hotep, but yeah. with Gibson can <laughs> still pull off the grizzled old cop thing. I mean, he's tough as nails and dragged across concrete. So, so I think uh, I'd be interested in seeing them do that. Well, there you go. In other words, there is a, in amongst a sea of terrible, and it is mostly sequels. But there are certain things that will persuade us to go to the cinema. Some of us more than others, I won't dear, die. Dear Odeon, I hereby give you notice of... <laughs> <laughs> They're all, it is interesting that they are all sequels, that it's you know it's the age of big blockbusters which just drown out everything else with a lack of originality. I, I'll go and see a lot of these tentpole I think films. Uh, I think there, there was a, a thing a little while ago where, um, I'm trying to remember who it was, it might have been Kermode um, when they were mentioning you know, what is the future of cinema? And he basically said, um, "Cinema can be broken. Well, will be broken down in a number of segments. And if it's anything that you're going to the cinema to see, um, and you're making the effort, then it's going to be the big blockbuster yeah. sequel, prequel, yeah, remake, that's... reboot, whatever. You're going to get nothing original at the cinema. Yes. And he said it's going to be other outlets. The, the the art house cinema will die, but that will be taken over by streaming services. Yeah." Um, who uh, who will then bring forward the next generation of filmmakers and so on, whether that's through TV series or through um, being given a budget to shoot the the little projects that they want to do or whatever. Um, that's that's what he reckoned. And that, when you look at the industry, I think that's the way it looks like it's going. To be honest, there there is an in between though, isn't there? Like that, there's there's a way for them to do these indie flicks. And then when a director, little known director, um, does a really good indie flick, they get to do a bigger movie. And that bigger movie doesn't have to be a sequel, doesn't have to be, a, you know, the guy drafted in to do that, the Godzilla movie, or, you know, it, it doesn't have to go that route. They can, they can also do original works. So, you know, you, you're going to get your A Quiet Place. You're going to get your tenants. I think you're still going to find a few of these smaller productions. And I, I hope, it might take another 10 years, I hope they run out of this whole remake business. They get tired of it and they mm, but, go well, down something else. D- Disney have built an empire on it, so I think that's going to go away yeah, anytime soon. No, not not sequels and franchise building, but remakes. Yeah, but they're remaking all their animated films. Yeah. Sure, they're going to run out. They're going to run out. Eventually, but they've got another 20 or 30 to get through first. Uh, yeah, they'll, they, just go, they'll just go back to the beginning again and start again. Oh God! I mean, yeah, it's it's. You're right about Disney. That's that's what I think is a bigger threat, if you want to call it that, because I do actually enjoy Disney movies. I mean, Commode's right that that you're going to have this split. No, I, I I don't know if it was him. But, I'm just it was somebody well, like him that mentioned it. So, but it's gonna it's gonna go worse than that because you know Disney could churn out. I mean, they did the other the other year, didn't they? I don't know whether it was last year or the year before. They did something like a, a movie a month, 
10 movies in the year and they were all you know the nine of them were in the top 10 biggest hits of the year and f- four of them crossed the billion mark yeah but so then they're going to be the if you look at the other flip of the coin though Kaz you've also got Scorsese moving to Netflix and doing Irishman um, you might see more of that happening true yes I know Scorsese was a producer on um, Uncut Gems wasn't he was he yeah, I mean, it'd be interesting to see what those directors do for that because Uncut Gems has made a, a lot of money for how much it cost. So, so that that these are the kind of directors I'd be interested in seeing what they, where they go with, because they make a lot of money. The 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 lady behind uh, Queen and Slim, um, debut director, uh, made a lot of money off a uh, 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 you know stonking good first movie. Uh, she could get handed the keys to the castle as long as she doesn't accept that Black Widow two gig. Um, you know, it it could be something interesting. So that that's that little grey area before they get sucked into sequels, where I still think we'll get a theatrical movie that's original, that's got a halfway decent budget. Um, that you know, there isn't a sequel, a remake, a you know, at t- least thing. This year and next year, we don't have to put out with a Star Wars movie, so that's good. I was, I was, I had the timer on. I'm thinking, how long before Steve mentions Star Wars? <clears throat> and and really, how can we complain about a year where we get Top Gun, Tenet, and Dune? Yeah, well, I mean, it's, yeah. it's I'm in for all of those. Yeah. So I, I mean, as we are about to wrap up recording, uh, but as we are recording, the Baftas are happening right now. 1917 is doing really well. I told you, 1917 is just going to get it. It's got the director and the cinematography. It, it almost doesn't matter about film. the film. Yeah, what I mean is, it's got it's got the it's got a, a director who's likely to win out of a lot of them, and it's got the best cinematography by far. Those are the two ones that you really. Did you need. watch um, Sam Mendes talking about picking various scenes from films? Uh, on, I think it was on Thursday night. Um, it's a new series actually. There's five of them and next week. This week, rather, it's Edgar Wright, but it was Sam Mendes. So he picked like a uh, you know a scene involving music, an opening sequence, um, you know, an edited a scene to demonstrate good cinematography, good editing, that sort of stuff. It was really interesting. Where was it? What out. was it? On BBC Four. So it'll be on iPlayer. I can't remember what it's called. It's like you know, cinematic moments or something like that. But it, it it's um, I'll, I'll let you know what um what the actual series is called. But it's uh it's a, it's a new series. So there's five episodes in total and um. Sam Mendes was the first one, so he picked uh, things like uh, the beginning of Blue Velvet, for example, which he said he shamelessly ripped off at the beginning of uh, the whole <laughs> uh, aesthetic was ripped off for American Beauty. I need a wee. And on that bombshell, uh, <laughs> I think it's time for us to wrap up anyway. Um, so yeah, uh, that's it for this week. My thanks to Steve Withers. Don't stiffen on me. Kaz Harlow. On this team, we fight for that inch. And Steve Withers. No, I've done you. Ed Sell. <laughs> No intensity, no victory. Don't forget, you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook, bookmarkaviforums.com for latest reviews, news and video. Plus, why not leave us a five-star rating on iTunes, but only if you enjoyed the show. Also, head over and check out our YouTube channel for videos of the latest product launches and reviews, and feel free to subscribe while you're there. Didn't read any of that. I'm Phil Hinton, thanks for listening, and we'll see you again next week. (laughs) 